So let's do a recap of what we've been covering in this series. Are you guys ready for that? All right, praise the Lord. Okay, so we've been looking at the subject in this series of the sanctuary. And as we've, look, we've been looking at this subject, we've seen that as it concerns the sanctuary, how many major sections are there in the sanctuary? Three. Now, the first section of the sanctuary is called the courtyard. How many articles are in the courtyard? Two. What's the name of the first article that we see when we come into the courtyard? Altar of sacrifice. We found out that that altar of sacrifice on which the lamb or the sacrifice was slain is a representation of what was going to happen in the future. Jesus' crucifixion, Calvary, right? Now, after the cross, the next article that we come to is called the laver. That's right, the laver of washing. And that laver is a representation of what aspect of our lives? Baptism, right? So after we receive Jesus Christ, we come to a knowledge of our sins. Then we come to the, the cross, Mount Calvary. We receive Jesus, the remedy for our sins. And then after that, a public declaration that we have received Jesus is made. And that public declaration is baptism. Now, once we move on from the courtyard, so we saw also, the other thing that we saw about this courtyard is that you remember when Jesus was on earth, were those articles attacked? Yes, right? Who attacked Jesus' ministry and John the Baptist's ministry? The leaders, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, so they were the movements that attacked Jesus' ministry and John's ministry. But on the other hand, there were movements that God raised up to protect the articles. And that was, who said it, who said it? Uh-uh, that comes a little later. You guys are close, though. What's that? Okay, close, close, close. It's who, who proclaimed the message on Pentecost? The disciples, right? Jesus' disciples. So what we found out is that during Jesus' earthly ministry, the courtyard and also the time of his baptism, as we looked at those articles, we found out that the two ministries or movements that God raised up to protect the articles were Jesus' ministry and John the Baptist's ministry, right? Those two ministries were to point people to the cross that was coming, and John's ministry was a ministry unto repentance to prepare the people for what Jesus was going to do in the future in that he would be sacrificed for our sins. So that was the courtyard. But after the courtyard, what's the next compartment of the sanctuary? The holy place. Now, you remember, we found out what articles were in the holy place. Three articles, right. What was the name of one of them? Candlesticks? Showbread? Prayer? Which, which, which article is that? Altar of incense, right? So, we found out that this was to be protected during the time that Jesus ascended to the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And you remember, somebody said it earlier, how did Jesus protect the articles when he got into the holy place? What movement was it? Somebody mentioned it. The Protestant Reformation, that's right. So we found out the Protestant Reformation was raised up to protect the articles because sadly, what system on earth was attacking those articles? What system on earth? Yes, the papal system, right. So the papal system attacked the articles in that men could not go to Jesus Christ directly. They had to come to him through a priest. They could not study the word of God because they needed who to teach them as well? A priest. 
And also, they could not spread the word of God lest they be killed, right? So this is what we saw as it concerns the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, what we're going to look at today is going to set us up for the next section of our study, which is there's one more compartment in the sanctuary. What compartment is that? The most holy place. That's right. So what we're going to do today is set the foundation to understand what was being done in the holy place that we may gain access now to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. All right, so you guys did great. So now we're going to go to the book of Leviticus chapter 4. So if you guys have your Bibles, go with me and your Bibles to the book of Leviticus chapter 4. All right, Leviticus chapter 4. We want to lay the groundwork because as we come to the most holy place, we're going to come to a time, friends, when we're going to see some powers that will arise in the future that have been and will attack the articles in the most holy place. So this is why we want to study this now to lay the groundwork so that we can understand more of it when it comes. So Leviticus chapter 4 and when you're in verse 27, say amen. Amen. All right. So Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 27. This is what it says there. And this is a, a staple. It's a pattern for the majority of the offerings that were offered on the altar of burnt offering. All right. This is what it says there in verse 27. And if one of the common people sin through ignorance... It is the same as also, this is different from sinning willfully, but the pattern of offering is similar. It says, if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he doeth somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done and be guilty, or if his sin which he had sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering a kid of the goats, a female without blemish. At times it was also a lamb without blemish, depending on the offering. For whose sin? His sin, which who hath committed? Who had sinned? He had sinned. And what shall he do with that offering? It says he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering. I want to read a statement to you guys here. This is found in a powerful book called Patriarchs and Prophets, page 354. It says, The most important part of the daily ministration was the service performed in behalf of individuals. The repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle and placing his hand upon the victim's head, confessed his sins, thus in figure transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice. So what's happening here? When they brought their offering, at times it would be a lamb. In this case, through sins of ignorance, it would be a goat, a female without blemish. As they brought that animal, they would then lay their hand upon the animal's head. And what was that a symbol of in the Bible? What, what was that meaning? What were they doing when they laid their hand upon the head of that animal? That's right. They were transferring their sins from themselves to the offering. And you remember, this offering was without blemish. So that means it's a symbol that it was innocent. It had nothing wrong with it. But who had something wrong with them? The sinner which is a symbol of us, right? We have something wrong, and we thereby symbolically transfer our sins to what offering? Jesus Christ, that's right. So all these animals that were sacrificed in the Old Testament is a symbol of the Lamb of God, the Son of God, that takes, that's, that's right, that takes away all of our sins, right? That takes away the sin of the world. 
So as we're looking at this, they're symbolically laying their hand upon, they're literally laying their hand upon this animal, symbolically transferring their sins from them to the animal, because you remember how many blood, how many bulls, goats, or lambs can actually forgive sin? None. So this was all a prophecy pointing forward to Christ. That's right. All of these prophecies were to remind the Jewish nation that a Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will rescue the people from their sins if they turn to him. Amen? So, as we look at this, we're seeing that they symbolically transferred their sins from themselves to the innocent victim, to the innocent lamb, in this case, to the innocent goat. Now, as this happened, friends, the next part says in verse 29 that the sinner would then slay the animal. Okay, so the animal was slain, and it actually tells us in Scripture that the priest would actually catch the blood of this animal, and they would then do something with that blood. So keep this in mind, all right? You remember, where did Jesus shed his blood? On the cross, on the cross of Calvary. But now we're going to find out something that's crucial, So you're in Leviticus 4, we've covered Leviticus 4, but I want us now to go in our Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 is where we're going next. All right? Does everything we've covered so far make sense? Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's go to, in our Bibles, to the book of Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. And when you are there, say amen. All right, praise the Lord. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. Now, you remember, we found out that in the Old Testament, there was, throughout the series we've been seeing, there there was a sanctuary in the Old Testament. But this sanctuary in the Old Testament was reminding us that there was a sanctuary one day to be activated where? In heaven, that's right. So now we're looking, we're going to transfer, we're going to see that everything that happens in the sanctuary on earth is a type of what will happen where? In heaven, that's right. So therefore there is, I repeat again, we we covered this ever so often, but it bears repeating, that means there is a sanctuary where? In heaven, okay? This is why we need the Old Testament. So it says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. So that means all that Paul has written so far, this is the substance of it. We have such an high priest. Who is that? Jesus who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, check this out, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Now remember, the sanctuary on earth was pitched by who? Man. But this sanctuary is pitched by whom? God, the Lord. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, Whereof it is of necessity that this man might have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of what kind of things? Heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in where? In the mount. So Moses was building the earthly sanctuary after a revelation that he received of the heavenly sanctuary. So he was making this after the pattern that he was seeing. And the pattern that he was seeing was in heaven. Okay, so we're saying all of this to say that Jesus Christ, just as the high priest on earth, 
was the main officer in the earthly sanctuary, who is the main officer in the heavenly? Christ. So Christ is both the offering and he is the, the priest who gives the offering. He is both. He is the lamb and he is the priest who officiates and applies the blood. Now look at this. It says this in verse 3. It says, For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. What sacrifice and offering did Christ offer? Himself. <laughs> he is the offering. So Christ now says, Okay, check this out. You remember, they lay their hand on the animal, symbolically transferring their sins from themselves to the to the offering, and then the offering is slain, the priest would catch the blood of that offering, and then we're going to see what he does with that blood. Okay, this is why, friends, apart from Jesus being innocent, therefore death could not hold him in the grave, we're going to see another reason why Christ rose from the dead. It was because he was going to do a new work for us. When Christ died on Calvary, only the first phase was completed. There's another phase, amen, that has to now be accomplished, that he continued during the time period of Pentecost and the Reformation. So, we're seeing this here. Now, go with me in your Bibles one chapter over. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. It says this in Hebrews chapter 9. And now we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Can I have a volunteer? Actually, verses 1 and 2. Can I have a volunteer for verses 1 and 2? All right. Thank you. So Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And there the first prophet had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe breads, which is called the sanctuary. All right. Okay, so thank you for reading that. Much appreciated. So we're seeing in verses 1 and 2, we're talking about the sanctuary, but now I'm going to ask you guys a quiz question. Which compartment of the sanctuary, which section of the sanctuary is here being referred to? The holy place, right? Because we have the articles listed. But now I need another volunteer for verses 3 and 4. Who can do that one for us? All right, thank you. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, <coughs> in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod, the wood, and the tablets of the covenant. Okay, thank you. All right, so as we're looking at this now, we're seeing we've just transitioned from the holy place to where? The most holy. The Bible calls it the holiest of all, the holy of holies. So we've transferred into there, and then they list the articles in verse 4. Now it continues by saying, And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into where first? The first tabernacle. Now, what do you think is being referred to when it says the first tabernacle? Uh-uh, not the courtyard. The whole, okay. All right, so let's read it. Let's check it out. So it says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, meaning the second part of the tabernacle, went the high priest alone how often? Once a year. So when we say first tabernacle, we're referring to what? The holy place. But then once a year, the priest would go into the second, which is the most holy place. That's right. So now we want to understand how this transition operates. When he goes into the most holy, this is what it says in verse 6. It says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second, when the high priest 
alone once every year, but notice how he goes. Not, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Now, friends, this is interesting. That means the offering that was offered on the outside of the tabernacle, after that offering was offered and slain, and the blood was caught, it was taken then where? Into the sanctuary. That's right. So it was taken into the holy and the most holy place. So the priests dare not go into the sanctuary without blood. The blood of the very animal that was sacrificed. Now why is that important? Because the blood was spilt in the courtyard. But that same blood that was spilled in the courtyard was carried into the sanctuary. The significance of this is that as we look at this blood, you remember, as the blood was slain, what was transferred to the animal before that blood was shed? Sin. So that means as the high priest catches the blood and then transfers it into the sanctuary, what is being carried with that blood? The sin. So therefore, sin is being transferred from the outer court. Now remember, that sin is that sin which was forgiven. Does that make sense? Because, the, because they applied their hand to the animal, confessed their sins over the animal, the animal was slain, the blood was caught. So now that blood, symbolizing forgiven sin, is transferred where? Into the holy and the most holy, right? So this is very interesting. So it's transferred, and get this, it's being transferred all year into the holy place. There's only once a year when the high priest enters the most holy. So all throughout the year, the sins of Israel are accumulating where? In the holy place. But you remember, those sins that are there are a symbol of what kind of sins? Is it, is it the sin of someone who's guilty or someone who's forgiven? Are you sure? <laughs> forgiven, right? So the sins of the forgiven are accumulating in the sanctuary. But if sin is in the sanctuary, what's happening to the sanctuary? The sanctuary is becoming dirty. That's right. It's becoming polluted. So the sanctuary, therefore, if it's becoming polluted, there has to come a point where the sanctuary is cleansed. God has to clean it up. And so therefore, this is why once a year in the Old Testament service known as the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go into the sanctuary no longer to forgive sin, but to blot it out, to clean it up from the sanctuary. And this is what we're going to allude to now as we come to the last portion of this message. But I want to make sure, friends, does this make sense? All right, so we're realizing then, if Jesus is now our high priest, he was doing a work in the holy place, we found out how long, and this is a question, let's see if you guys, if you guys can remember it, I remember when I first found out, it took me a little while to remember, but let's see, how long, you remember Jesus was in the holy place all throughout the papacy's reign, does anyone remember how long was the papal reign? Times, times and a half a time. You remember, we found out how many years was that? 1,260 years. That's right. So Jesus was in the sanctuary since the days of his ascension. He was in the holy place. And all throughout the period of the Reformation... He was in the holy place. But we're seeing, according to the earthly model of the sanctuary, there has to come a time when the high priest transitions from the holy to the most holy. 
and the work in the most holy, even while Jesus, yes, is forgiving our sins still, the major work of Jesus in the most holy place is to blot sin out. So friends, there's coming a time where our Savior will blot our sins out of existence. As we are confessing our sins now, they are ascending to the heavenly sanctuary, and they are there. But what Christ wants to do at this moment in earth's history, just as the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, the high priest entered once a year into the most holy place for the purpose of blotting sin out, Jesus Christ, at the end of his ministry, which is actually, as we're going to find out, at the end of the world, He is going to enter into this last compartment to blot our sins out. All right? Does this make sense? Amen? All right. So now let's go to the last section of our study. All right? So take your Bibles and go with me in your Bibles. Let's vindicate this from Scripture. And as time goes on, we will look at this in time prophecy. But right now, I just want to give the gist of it so we can see it a little bit. So, Revelation chapter 22, and I want you to go to verse 12. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. And as you go there, I'll I'll lay a little groundwork as you go there. So, in the Old Testament, as the priest did his work on the Day of Atonement, that day when he sought to blot Israel's sins out, Israel was petitioning God. They were bearing their souls out to God, the Old Testament tells us, that their sins might be taken care of. So as the high priest was in the sanctuary, in the most holy place doing a work, the people were also doing a work as well, of making sure that they were right with God. So that when the priest had finished his work, the people would receive the approval of God, their sins would be wiped out and they would stand before a holy God without blemish in their lives. So this is the work we're going to find out that Jesus will do at the very end of time. It says in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12, it says, And behold, Jesus speaking, you may have the words in red in your Bible, Behold, I come how? Quickly. So how is Jesus coming? Quickly. So we are to see Jesus soon. But before this, I want us to look at this. It says, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The word reward there is actually positive and negative, depending on the works of the individual. So if the work of the individual is evil, what reward do you think they're going to get at the second coming? Condemnation. They're going to perish at the brightness of the coming of the Son of Man. But if their works are produced by a faith that works by love and purifies the soul, then what do you think their reward will be? Everlasting life. All right. So Jesus is saying here, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, what this text is revealing to us is not just the truth as it concerns the reality of Jesus's soon return, but it's revealing to us something else that's vital as we transition and set the stage for our further study of the most holy place. If when Christ returns, he is disseminating rewards to every man according to his words, that means there must be a judgment prior to the second coming to determine at the second coming who gets what reward. Christ is rewarding men and women according to the works that he has already examined in their lives. That means prior to the second coming then, there must be an examination 
to determine who gets what reward. Does that make sense? Right? So that means, are we living in the time before the second coming? Are we living right now in the end of time? So is Jesus soon to return? Are we living in the last days? That means then, if we're living in the time just prior to the second coming, what must then be transpiring now? A judgment. An examination must be taking place to determine how we will be rewarded at the return of the Son of Man. This is why, friends, my call to us today is that just as the children of Israel, knowing that the high priest was doing his final work throughout the year, he was doing his final work on that day of atonement, they made sure that their lives were in harmony with God. They make sure that their lives were covered by the blood of the Lamb so that their sins were not only forgiven, but would be wiped away. Our work in this time, just prior to the coming of Jesus, is to make sure that our lives are in harmony with the Lamb. Are our sins forgiven? Are we living in harmony with the life of Christ, following that life to the T, that we might reveal that life to the world? Are we making sure that is my life in harmony with the word of God? This is our work at this hour. So that when Jesus Christ returns, we would have passed that judgment, standing with our sins blotted out, so that when Christ comes in the clouds of glory, our reward can be eternal life. Does, does this make sense to each and every one of us? This work that Christ is calling us to do at this hour? Because Christ is now doing that final work of examination. And so our work, therefore, on earth is to make sure that our lives are in harmony with his life. If we have fallen, there is good news. We can rise up again, and God can continue his work of changing us. One more scripture I will read to us as we end, and this is found in 1 John, because I want to give us hope in the midst of this. I want to leave us with hope in the midst of this judgment. So 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and we covered this verse before, but I want us to cover it again as we close. So if you have your Bibles, go to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Many of us here today, we are seeking to make our lives right with God. We are seeking to live in harmony with his principles. But in our human frailty, many times we have failed. And we wonder, can I come back to a holy God in the midst of my failure? And friends, the good news is what 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 and two states to us. It says, They're my little children. These things write I unto you that you what? You sin not. So what is John's ideal for the church? Not to sin. And friends, can God bring us to a point where we experience that? Yes. Right? But on the way to that journey where we experience and learn to experience the power of the cross. John says, and if any man sin, we have what with the Father? An advocate, a support system with the Father. And who is that support system? Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so therefore, God is saying to us, the goal here is to reach that point where I can uphold you and the ideal is met. But God knows that many times we must learn through our failings to come to him and to surrender to him. We learn this actually, it's a powerful story. You guys know the story of Peter when he, he told Christ, I will never desert you. Even if everyone else turns away from you, I will never turn away from you. And you remember what happened. 
<laughs> yes, he denied him, right? So therefore, as this happened, it's a powerful thing. You guys can read it in the powerful book, Desire of Ages, and also the powerful um, connection of, of devotionals called Christ Triumphant. We are told that as Peter sinned against Christ, just over across the way, Christ was being judged. And it says that Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes met at that moment when he denied him. And the Bible continues by saying that Peter remembered what Jesus told him and he wept bitterly. He ran away from the sight of the Son of God, which was not a sight of condemnation, we are told. But friends, one of the things that I wanted to bring out here is that Peter, after that failure, do you think he was ever the same? No. Inspiration actually tells us that Peter had to learn the valuable lesson of what it means to maintain our allegiance to Christ through failure. Many times this is how it happens for us. As we fall and we fail Jehovah, we must remember that he does not give up on us at that moment. Christ says the moment that we fail, return unto me. And he that comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. If we are willing to walk with God patiently, as he is patient with us, he will teach us how to hold on to him until the point, until we come to the point where inspired writings tell us we will have victories uninterrupted. But he must teach us that way moment by moment how to hold on. So my prayer for us today is that we will hold on as we are in this time of examination, that we might be brought to the point through Jesus Christ where we are able to stand before God fully experiencing his righteousness. Is that your prayer? Amen. Then as we close, if that is your desire, to be able to go through this examination, this pre-Advent judgment that we are experiencing right now, and stand true to God in that time, in this time in which we are living, I ask you to stand with me as we close. And I will kneel as you stand, but if you would bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we have gone through much today, but I pray that this truth made sense. That we are now living in a time just prior to the second coming of Jesus, where we are going through an investigation. Our lives are being looked at. But we have hope. This is not, this, while this is a solemn truth, it is also a hopeful one. For we have a Savior that is standing before the Father's throne, interceding on our behalf that we might win in this investigation. Father, keep us, uphold our lives, and teach us the science of victory, the science of a faith that works by love and results in the purification of the soul. Do this in us, we pray. And we ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen.